got a cup we're, of coffee we're, now. We're so. doing what you told me to do. Oh, okay, son, good, good, yes. good. Well, I'll let you uh, wrap up the day, and then we'll head out to Cuba Libre Cuba for dinner. Cuba Libre, all right, for some rum and cokes with lime. I went to bartending school, so I know what a Cuba Libre is. Hello, everybody. So, Excellence Revisited here. Here I am, sort of bookending the day. This is a session where we look back at some of the Model of Excellence winners from years past and see how things have been. Are you still as excellent as you always were? We think you are. Um, but before we do that, we want to just kind of give you some stats, too, going back. Looking back, and again, this is really the brainchild of, of, of Russell and Megan have done most of the work on this and picking these folks. But we look back at all of the MOE winners uh, since the beginning of time. An astounding 97% of them are still in business. So that's a good sign. Uh, a number of them got acquired for some big numbers here. 28% have had some kind of change of control. So you see some big numbers on there in terms of acquisitions. And then a couple actually have gone public. Again, some big names there. You look at things like Russell picking out LinkedIn and Zillow way back when. That's kind of like Usher seeing Justin Bieber's video <laughs> early on and going, that guy's got it. So I don't know how extensible that'll be for the rest of the business, but it works for this example. But uh, just some ideas on how we think we really do know how to pick them. So today the panel, we can go back to that other slide if you want. So today the panel, this really session underscores the pace of change and innovation. And it's also known as our open the kimono session. And that's just the metaphor, guys. All right. So just stay cool. Um, but we've got top executives here from past information, uh, info commerce model of excellence companies. And we want to kind of review what they've done and, and, and how they've been. So let me go back over here for the questioning. So the first step is to have each of you kind of give an idea for the, uh, for the group here, what your business is, what your data is, your market, and your model. So why don't we start with you? Sure. Right, I'm, I'm sorry. Um, I'm I'm sorry. I didn't introduce everybody here. I'm sorry. So this is Mark Lair from WAND, Chris Golick from uh, Demandbase, and Mike Alfred from Brightscope. So. Yes, I'm, I'm Mark Lair. I'm the CEO at WAND. And I guess when I saw those slides, the first one, I was really happy that we weren't in that 3%. <laughs> And then the next one, I was pretty disappointed that we we're in the $25 oh. million dollar exit. But um, my company does taxonomies. And that's actually different than what we did when we were model excellence seven years ago. I think it was seven years ago when we were focused on doing a business to business directory platform. But one of the elements that we had developed to power that business directory platform was a very deep uh, product and service taxonomy. So over the years, we've pivoted and focused really on just providing taxonomies, that taxonomies and others that we've built, as well as related tools and services to help people organize unstructured information. And that might be um, unstructured text, it might be e-commerce information, it might be transactions, any number of different elements where we can bring taxonomy in. So who do you sell to? What's your, your marketplace? Um, that's, a, that's a good question. I think the, the biggest, the broadest market that we're selling in right now is into Microsoft SharePoint. So that really does focus on the unstructured text. So the SharePoint 2010 was the first enterprise content management system that offered support for taxonomies in a meaningful way. So that was a big benefit for us and that's opened up a, a huge number of, uh, you know, a giant lead flow of people who are interested in learning more about taxonomies. And then beyond that, it's, um, we're starting to do a lot of work in the e-commerce space. We just uh, this week released a beta of a product information management system built around our product and service taxonomy. And then from there, it's really opportunistic. And in, uh, I think a blessing and a curse of having a taxonomy business is that taxonomies can be used in so many different places. So opportunities come up and we'll talk with customers and try to find if it's a fit for what we do or if it's not. Do, they, do you clean people's taxonomy? I mean, if somebody's got something existing today, a legacy taxonomy, do you go in there as a service and try and clean that up and reorganize it? We might. So one thing, one area we've done a lot of work is um, business listing publishers, specifically online yellow pages. And, and their challenge is they have their listing data, and it's anywhere from three to 6,000 YP category headings. And they don't really want to give that up, although that's changing a little bit. So what we do in that case is we will help map keywords to those heading systems so that they're, they keep their existing taxonomy, but it's more searchable. Someone types in sofa, it's going to take the user to a listing of furniture companies. So you link those two or right. kind of expand on that stuff. So together. we can either help you create a taxonomy or we can help do work to your existing taxonomy to make it a little bit more useful. 
Does anybody use your taxonomy in any kind of social listening devices and social listening systems? Because um, those things tend to be a mess, <laughs> right? So, I, I mean, I dealt with one of them. They were pitching me, and I just gave an example, and I said, well, I have an existing set of products that I want to import in here. And they said, oh, you just key it all in. I said, well, how do I know if I'm listening about Oreo that it's a cookie? And she went through this big, long thing and said, you can look at the word cloud, and here's cookie. And I said, but I already know it's a cookie. Right? I've got a right. file that says Oreo's a cookie. Can I import in there? And it's just this notion that of having an existing taxonomy to use to listen. Is that an opportunity? Have you been seeing any of that? Um, that that's not a space that we've, we've done a lot of work in. We do have one, cus one partner, I guess, who's um, integrated our sentiment taxonomy into a sentiment analysis. Okay, all right, so that's similar. So that's yeah, kind of the approach there. So you're doing something different today than you did when you went... Very different. So, okay. Yeah. Hold that thought. <laughs> Chris, if you can take us through what, what sure. you guys are doing. Yeah. That sounds a lot more difficult than what we're doing. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. So we have a targeting and personalization technology for the B2B sector. So we sell primarily to middle market, to large enterprises. And the, the value that we deliver to customers is, is around helping them bring the right companies to their website through targeted advertising personalization of that experience when those companies come, and then we tie that together with the sales activity. Um, and the value that's created there is all based on a data platform that we've built over the years and that maps network IP addresses to businesses worldwide. And we've built our own proprietary data to do that. Now, we didn't set out to build that exact business. Uh, I think back in 2008, um, that was still 100% on the, the category. Okay. Um, <laughs> Our business was more around generating leads for companies, and the model there was we were going to aggregate data from a variety of different sources, clean it, combine it, and then allow people to build custom, li custom lists on demand, and uh, it kind of had this iTunes look and feel for, for more of a shopping experience. And in the process of doing that, um, we looked at how can we combine leads and lists and contact information with your website traffic. And in the process of doing that, we figured out it is really hard to identify companies on your website beyond the Fortune 1000, because most companies are hidden behind Comcast and Verizon. So we figured out how to do that really well and make our product better. And then we realized, geez, if that data makes our product better, it would make advertising better, it would make websites better, it would make web analytics better. And we actually totally uh, exited the whole business contact business altogether, and we're 100% a technology business today. So you're completely different. It's completely different, bus different business model, different customers, different engineers, different salespeople. So big change. Same guy, though, right? You're still and more, we needed more money. OK. All right. <laughs> so. Mike, are you doing the same thing? So our, our <laughs> high-level high premise is still more or less the same. But when I came here last, um, I didn't even realize we were an information business. So I was pleased to be invited back because I thought maybe you'd notice that I didn't know what I was talking about okay, last no, time. No, you, you did a great job last time, so Thank we're you. good. So that was 2010, <laughs> the time we said we were going to bring radical, dramatic transparency to the retirement plan market. And I think we have, for the most part. We went out to the Department of Labor. We got all the data about plans. We, we publish uh, 0 to 100 scores, a la Morningstar, who's our role model. Um, and we drove a lot of change in the industry, um, not just with participant behavior, but also large plan sponsors that work with us to benchmark their retirement offering and make changes to it. Uh, financial advisors who use the data to benchmark and prospect. They're looking for uh, CFOs that don't know what they're doing. They have a terrible fund in large cap and fees are 2%. They don't even know it. Uh, and then large companies like BlackRock, PIMCO, Fidelity, T. Rowe, who believe it or not, these huge uh, mega asset manager, record keeper firms don't even know where their own sales are coming from in the retirement marketplace or in, in the case that we've expanded to uh, through sales through financial advisors. So they can't tell you which Morgan Stanley advisor in Houston is actually moving product for them. Um, and so we've, we've grown a lot. Um, the premise is still there, bring transparency, but where I think we've gotten more sophisticated is just understanding the enterprise use cases mm -hmm. um, for all the data that we're gathering and then compelling our customers to feed a lot more data into our platform so that we can add more value. So for example, with a firm like T. Rowe Price or LPL or Merrill Lynch, we give them a lot of value off the shelf just by helping them see, have visibility into where sales are coming from. But they're also putting data in and then sharing amongst themselves. Um, so where we've established protocols where LPL can essentially 
rather than send an Excel spreadsheet to 50 different asset managers, they send it to us one time, we clean it, merge it, map it. When BlackRock's wholesalers actually pull it up on an iPad, it's clean. So they're looking at an advisor's face and contact information and they're seeing all of their sales um, of their products through that advisor. So you're in the middle of that process. Yeah, you we're put become, yourself in the middle there. Think of us as becoming a, a massive data clearinghouse uh -huh. um, for the financial services industry. So we still care about the consumer. We, like Morningstar, if you look at Morningstar's business, really interesting, right? They have this one to five star rating that drives a ton of purchase behavior in the mutual fund market, but they make no money off of that really directly. They're making it off of licensing software and data to the same customers I serve. But the difference between Brightscope and Morningstar is Morningstar cares about the performance of the fund. I, I really don't care about the performance at all or uh, whether the large cap value fund is beating its benchmark or what the holdings are. I care about did this Morgan Stanley advisor in Houston sell that fund yesterday huh. or last week. I care whether or not it exists in the Google 401k plan or not. And, and if it used to exist, when it was replaced on the menu, was it replaced by a fund from T. Rowe or from Newberger Berman? So you're looking at the makeup of these big retirement funds. We're just, think of it as broad distribution analytics um, to help companies understand where the sales. Where do you get from. it all? I mean, how do we? Well, the, most of the high value stuff now actually comes from customers and sharing amongst customers in a network approach. Oh, okay. As opposed to where we started, it was very much go to the government agencies and get anything we can. It's still a big part of what we do and there's a lot of value there, but um, we're moving up the sort of the stack from a value. So you built this kind of consortium approach where you've got people sharing and then how does that start? They were doing to that already. They were just doing it in a, in a, to be honest, a really crappy fashion. So uh -huh. we, we just came in and said, you can do this better. As a putting a standardized approach to mm -hmm. it. Pro standardize the protocols. You can track now who's using your data. So you send it in an Excel spreadsheet by email, it's insecure and you can't see which wholesalers at BlackRock are using it, mm -hmm. right? But if you already have all the BlackRock users on your platform, you could see which user actually looked at a certain data point. So you can understand if you're a large broker dealer, where, you're, where they're getting leverage from using your data. Okay. So when you start to pull all that, pull all that data together, are you able to pull things out like share or market penetration or you know, market metrics that wouldn't come from any other place? Is that Absolutely. starting to happen? Yeah, and we do awesome. have a research group that puts out uh, research as well. We're about 70 people now, but I think by the end of the next year we'll be right around 100, maybe a little, a little bigger, and we're really focusing on sales marketing right now. So uh -huh. we, you know, our board came to us recently and said, you guys are spending way less than you need to as a percentage of your top line on sales and marketing. It seems like you guys <laughs> love technology. And we said, yeah, because that was the right thing to do at the time. So we're trying to get that balance right. We're letting our development team budget sort of sit at the same amount and we're spending a lot more on sales. We're just looking for excuses to spend more money on sales and marketing. Right, this right is like the opposite story of most people. Well, right? but if you, look at all the, if you look at all the SaaS companies that went public in the last few years, they were spending between 35 and say 50% uh -huh. of top line on sales and marketing and they were losing a lot of money, but they went public because they were still growing at 50 plus percent. Uh -huh. You know, think of companies like ServiceNow, right? Or Workday. Excellent companies, hugely scalable, they're losing a ton of money and they spend a huge percentage of their top line on sales and marketing. We were being too conservative and part of that's we only raised 5.6 million in funding. Mm -hmm. um, so we've had to be a lot leaner. We look like a company that's raised more but we've managed to do it out of cash flow over the last three years rather than raising a ton of money. Uh -huh. No, that's a great story. Again, have board members coming and saying you're not spending enough money. It's an unusual situation, I guess, there. I wish they'd pay us more, though. Well, they, okay, yeah, well, we'll take the money. Right? Yeah. Did you try that? So anyway, I'm just shifting back over to uh, um, Mark and Chris. So both of you have really done a pivot or a different view of, of the business opportunity from where you started. If you can kind of take us through, each of you, the thinking. What, you know, what happened? When did you really decide, okay, now it's time to, to, to make a big change? I mean, for, for us, it was about uh, market opportunity and differentiation in the marketplace. And so one of the things when we set out um, to offer this business leads and contact information, uh, despite our best efforts, um, the quality of contact information, while that was better um, maybe than what you could buy through a, just a direct list, it wasn't still way above the customer's expectations. And it's so, a pretty, I mean, it's a relatively crowded market. Yeah, it's awesome, yeah, but I mean, right. that prospects was here, Salesforce has got something, Zoom info, and so you were in so that, that, in so that space. So it was there. interesting, yes, and we yeah. used all their data, and it was all part of it, but the market opportunity was somewhat limiting, differentiation was low, and the core values of our company were all around innovation and customer success. So it didn't 
fit well. And so with this um, innovation around business identification in real time, the market potential there was just 100 times larger. And so that's when we kind of made the shift. And that was right around you know, 2009, 2010. So a, a difficult time to be out raising financing. Yeah, and, well. and making that big shift. From like That's an right. internal HR-ish perspective, how did that go over? I mean, were there people who just couldn't make that leap, or was it yeah. that different? Well, you know, it was very different, yeah. because you had salespeople that were more accustomed to doing transactional-based sales okay. versus subscription, higher-end deals to larger companies. That's one. You had engineers that were Java programmers, and now you need people that know how to build in Ruby on the cloud, number two. Um, you needed marketers that know how to evangelize a new technology, not people that build literature and do events. So, I mean, very, yeah, dra very dramatic change. So, yeah. um, but it wasn't uh, you know, dramatic downsizing and rebuild. It was more of a shift. No, but from a leadership perspective, yeah. you've got, you're, you have to make that move. You've got to keep you know, student body left, and everybody's got to move that way. And so yeah, and quite it's often definitely a challenge, right? People don't make those changes. They, uh -huh. they hold on to the legacy. Um, and so we, I'm glad we made that change because now we're, you know, so much more successful for doing that. Any advice you can give to the group on trying to, you know, trying to communicate that, how you manage through that or? Kind of go with your gut and sooner <laughs> is probably better because you, it's, tar it's tough to do two different businesses like that uh -huh. at the same time. No, I, I, I bet. So, so Mark, if you can take us through your story too in that too. Yeah, I, th I think that's a, a similar experience as far as shifting. So we had our business directory um, business to business directory business. Again, the, the, the taxonomy was sort of embedded into. And I think the reason that business didn't really work is, is our model was to partner with YP, major YP publishers. We tried to identify a big player in countries around the world. And, and we were successful in doing that in 12, 13 different countries. I think the, the problem was um, the sales of the, our product you know, which was just to enhance listings, kind of a traditional model. Um, while it may have been significant to us, what the revenue they were doing, it wasn't significant to them. I think these companies all, as we know, had challenges moving from their print business to digital. And so we really didn't get the attention and we couldn't keep the attention. And, and I think if, if, I would have done any, if we would have done anything on the directory side, it would have been to focus on building that business ourselves instead of relying on partners. Mm. So we had a directory business. It was sort of you know, going along. But what we began to realize is that the taxonomy we had developed always got great feedback and then seemed to be something strategic that no one else had. So um, we also began to make that shift. It wasn't as quick. or it was, it, I don't think it was quick or cut and dry. It was just more the conversations we began to have, the sales opportunities began to be more around the taxonomies that we had and, and less around the directories. Um, so over a few years, sad to say, we, we did make that transition and now we're, we're really focused on providing taxonomies. And, and I think we had a lot of the same challenges. Some of the people we had on the sales side um, you know, selling a directory platform, or just the concept of directory platform and the idea of a business model around upgraded listings is very different than a sale where you're going in and understanding somebody's search needs and how you can help them organize information around a taxonomy and, and how a taxonomy is going to help to solve that problem. Um, so we also had to make some human resources shifts, particularly on the sales side, but also on the engineering side to get the really the right skill set in place to, to sell the product. Cause, um, Unfortunately for me, taxonomy, is, it's a difficult product to sell. And you, you need to speak the customer's language and really be able to go in and understand what their challenges are and make recommendations. It's very different than the skill set you need to, to talk about a directory model. No, it's I, so master data kind of infrastructure stuff, too. And it's one of those, if you get the, the wrong kind of person, they don't even understand it's supposed to even exist. Right. So what is that? I just do that anyway. Or... You know, you've got to really dig into the bowels of the organization and the infrastructure to get your stuff embedded in there and then. Right, and, and I think six years ago when we started to kind of make this shift, um, really people did not have the awareness of taxonomies that they do today. And I, I wouldn't say that awareness of taxonomies is great today, but it's much, much better. It's selling is much, much easier than it was five years ago. But then at that point we're evangelists. Mm -hmm. um, so you, you also need the right people to evangelize something. They really have to understand it and can speak to it and keep it simple for somebody. And 
so that's 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 where we've really shifted. Uh -huh. From a content perspective, you cover a lot of different areas, right? So how right. many? You know, just kind of give us an idea of the of the topic areas you cover. Yeah, so w w I think another shift we had to do, we, we st had this product and service taxonomy, we identified opportunities for that, but there was a lot of opportunities where people needed taxonomies that simply are not products and services. So J Jeanette this morning talked about how IBM's focused on building taxonomies. Um, because you know, 80% of the data is unstructured, but most of that is not really around products and services. It's like an oil and gas company. They care about accidents and fires and earthquakes and the type of crude oil. And, and um, So we began to develop out those other industry segments and also horizontal business areas. So we've developed taxonomies for sales and marketing, human resources, IT, legal, accounting and finance. And then on the industry vertical side, um, just released nonprofit. We've done oil and gas, mining, banking, finance, and investment. Probably 35 different subjects, and, and we're we have a a few people working on new taxonomies on a regular basis. We probably release one a month. Yeah. How do you decide what to do next? What's your taxonomy <laughs> of opportunities? <laughs> That's <laughs> uh, I'm in charge of that list. Um, <laughs> You know, I, th I think we've, we have a lot of conversations with clients in the market, particularly in the SharePoint space. So one, one strategy we did with SharePoint and Microsoft is we partnered with them and made a general taxonomy available as a free download. We've had about 7,000 companies download that. So you, you begin to get a sense of who's interested in taxonomies and what, what industries are going to make the most sense to go to next. Mm -hmm. So that, that's how we do the prioritization. So do you have a professional services kind of approach too? Or, I mean, you go and... Yeah, we do. So we have off-the-shelf taxonomies, but those are really just a starter set. So another sort of unfortunate reality is we're not going to generally be able to create something that's a perfect fit for our clients. So we do have a professional services team that can come in and help do taxonomy, customization, help do needs analysis, things of that nature's nature, and then either customize the foundation taxonomies we've created or help companies create them from scratch. Are you really organized? Are you, <laughs> As I said this morning, you, you can, you can, you can ask my wife here. that. Uh, <laughs> okay. You'll get your real answer. Okay. Um, you know, just from in terms of the, the revenue split or just the business split, too, um, uh, um, Chris and Mike, do you have a professional services versus data side of it? You know, how does that kind of split out, if at all? Well, for us, I mean, we've been almost 100% focused on building the subscription recurring revenue uh -huh. side, and we've been really lucky. All the revenue we've been losing this year has been non-recurring. Not, not, not a, something we were really focused on, but I mean, it, it's, it's What happening. was that stuff? Was that just was stuff, know, ad hoc we, or we, reports? It or? was stuff that you do in order to get a customer kind of onto your product. Oh, okay. We're not trying to, to, to be a consulting firm or a services firm or anything like that, but sometimes in order to sign a big customer, you end up doing a little bit of custom work, which mm -hmm. I guess is fairly standard. Um, I'll look back on this five years from now and wonder if what I said was dumb, but um, at, at right now that, that type of revenue is lucky for us going away and it seems like we're getting more folks just coming and saying we want exactly what BlackRock has or exactly what T. Rowe has. No, it's the beauty of that part of the and syndicated data business of if you can build yeah, that. Yeah, and then maybe that's the part of the curve we're on right now, but uh -huh. right now we're losing non-recurring uh, services and one-off type things and seem to be getting more people who want the off-the-shelf version, which is good. No, that's great. That's great. Chris, anything? Yeah, you we have probably a little bit less than 10% uh, of strategic services to clients, but we do it for the dollar of recurring revenue, which we know is worth $5. Okay, so Over same kind of thing as it's, a, it's you know, not a loss leader, time. but a way to just, you know, fill that gap between, you know, that gets you to yes. That's right. So, so that works. So anything, just in thoughts before I open it up to the group here, you know, if you had to start your business, could you start? Do your business today, start it today the way you would have started it years ago? What would be some of the changes you would make? How would you do it differently? God, I don't know. Anybody? For, yeah, for us. <laughs> yeah, so. Go ahead. I'll jump out on that one. So I had a company back in 1998. It was a data and software company. It was supply chain software. Not, not sexy at all. But we had this combination data directory with our own taxonomy and supply chain software. When we tried to get investors to invest, uh, all the Silicon Valley firms would say, data companies don't do software well, software companies don't do data well, no thanks. And you fast forward now, 14 years, is it 14 years? Um, 
and everything is, do you have big data? Like, I don't even think they know what big data is. They yeah, just well, make sure it's, it's, it's in the It's still open for some discussion. <laughs> it, it does create a lot more value and retention and um, stickiness for customers. And so the investor's appetite for these businesses that have the combination of technology and, and software and data all together is so much higher than huh. one on their own. So no, that's dramatically an different. dynamic. Yeah, yeah. So they're they, they're looking for those different elements together rather than before, where they had kind of this prejudice that it couldn't work if you had all three. Exactly. Of them. Oh, a very interesting, different environment for sure. What do you think, Mark? Um, so if I were to start my company today, what would I do different? Yeah. That, I, that, that's a tricky challenge because over the last, or a tricky question for me, over the last six years we've learned so much about really how to sell taxonomies and how to talk about taxonomies to people um, that we wouldn't have starting it today. I th but I think today the timing is so much better as far as receptivity around using taxonomies. And again, I, that 80% of the unstructured information inside the enterprise that people want to get at, that's really valuable information and I think there's a greater appreciation and greater efforts to try to get at that information. So, um, you know, I, I think, I, I don't know if I would start a taxonomy business today from scratch, but you know, ha having the experiences we have, I, I feel like we're well positioned to, to extract the value now. Mm -hmm. No, I think there's a lot of, oper you know, big data, big data management, yep, if you, you want to call it that, which is, you know, yet to be totally defined either needs a lot of that kind of research. Yeah, absolutely. So, yeah. So I'd love to open it up to the group here. If some questions. Oh, come on. You can't leave till each table asks a question. That's our requirement. There we go. That's the first table. That, that'll do it. And the microphone was right here. <clears throat> I had a question for uh, Mike at Brightscope. Um, you talked about getting government data as sort of the start or the seed for uh, the database. Could you talk a little bit more about the other data that you've brought in and the sources uh, for it? Sure. Yeah, and um, just so you know, there's a new book that just came out on open government data. I think it just came out yesterday. And Ryan, who's right there in the audience, my brother, wrote a chapter. It's beyondtransparency.org. Right. Book's Beyond Transparency. And he wrote the sixth chapter in there. It's, it's actually a really good story of kind of how we broke through the bureaucracy in Washington, D.C., which we didn't understand when we went in there. but That probably helped break through it, right? Because you didn't know what yeah, you were I mean, up if against. You, if I knew now what we were going to have to do, I'm, I'd still do it. Yeah. But the one thing I would change, I didn't get to answer this question, uh -huh. is, is I would Oops. be rich before I started the company. OK. Because <laughs> um, you get to own more of it. Um, <laughs> but I'm not sure, again, I'm not sure I would have done it if I was rich before. I'd probably still be on vacation. So. You must have a hell of a retirement plan, though. Do you, uh, do you, do I contribute the max, yeah, okay. and I've got a Vanguard uh, Target Day Fund series in there. so. <laughs> Um, but in terms of other, in terms of other uh, data sets, um, the, one of the, the big ones is the SEC uh, and FINRA data set on advisors, because if you want to be able to show a mutual fund family really robust analytics on you know, where their sales are coming from, you have to go deeper than just Merrill Lynch. You want to go one layer deeper to branch, or you want to go one layer deeper to team, and then you want to go down to the advisor level. Yeah. Um, so the SEC, you can work up from the SEC data and get some of that. Um, so, so that's another public data source, but it's a really important one that when we started, FINRA actually sent us a nasty letter and we had to get on a call with like five attorneys from FINRA and three attorneys from our side and they yelled and screamed and said, you can't do this. And I said, well, if, if, if you tell us we can't, we're going to tell the Wall Street Journal that FINRA said that we can't publish this data for the benefit of consumers. And then they just went silent. I haven't heard from them. <laughs> for a couple of years now. Shut but up, five lawyers yeah. at once. Yeah, it was a, and, and my own world. corporate counsel said to me afterwards, he said, I didn't think that was going to work. <laughs> but people are scared of the, of the press, including government agencies. And if you have enough leverage in terms of being able to get your story published, um, sometimes that'll keep them at bay. So I think getting public data is great, but I think the ultimate goal is to get data directly from your customers. And so we pull data out of CRM systems in both directions. Um, we pull data from all these uh, transaction processing systems that exist within mutual fund families. So you might have heard of you know, transfer agency or sub-accounting systems, those sorts of things. Uh, we're processing that data downstream and, and we're realizing, wow, these systems have been built up over 30 years at the cost of a billion dollars and they barely even work anymore. And so we're wondering, that's an area that needs to be disrupted. We're hoping that we'll be one of the firms to do that. So we're trying to get data from anywhere we can to add value. Just in that, in that vein, too, in terms of this consortium model, people uh, contributing data, how do you get those 
first folks to trust you. I mean, I know that you know once you get to a certain point, it's probably yeah. easier. But those first conversations, how do how do those go? Well, there's a couple things. One is you have to be around in financial services. You can't just show up and raise thirty million dollars from Silicon Valley VCs and, and show up. No one will buy anything. Okay, you we're seeing that. There's a few <laughs> other firms that have done that, and they can't seem to get any traction because you have to be in this market for at least five years before anyone really takes you seriously. Right. Like some of the firms, like the CEO of Morningstar, like we love them. We've been quoted in the press 800 times saying they're our role model. He wouldn't take the call or have a meeting for about five years. Right. CEOs of a bunch of the asset managers won't talk to you until they've seen you around. You have to be quoted in the journal like 10 or 15 times. And then eventually their secretary, one of their three secretaries will reach out <laughs> to schedule lunch. And so it's just time and market and most entrepreneurs aren't patient enough. Yeah. Um, to do that for, for a long time. And so in relationships, because it's very incestuous. So we sold uh, a product to a guy who was at MFS running distribution. Then he left and went to BlackRock. So then our product went in at BlackRock. And now he's, his best friend is just went in at Fidelity. So we, you know, we're in there now. And so a lot of it is a relationship sale. And that's hard to explain to VCs who want it to just sort of naturally go viral and scale. Uh -huh. It's still a blocking and tackling game on the sales side. And it takes a long time. To, to get credibility. So. I mean, it's, it's not about the tech, there are no technical hurdles really to that, right? Of, of it's, pooling it's not, this data, it's, it's more science. about the... I mean, we have a 25 person in-house development team that's gonna grow to 40 next year and eventually be 100 or 200, but they're smart, but, and some of them get offers from Google, but that's not how, we're not winning on technology. Uh -huh. We're winning on branding, relationships, and strategy over time. And sitting in the middle there. I mean, if you can start to get in the middle, as you said, and, and, and be that common source, then the value of having a second source just diminishes yeah. There's a bit of, day, so, so one other comment I'd make is there's a bit of pacing and timing here, because if you, for example, if you get Fidelity in the retirement market as your first client, T. Rowe Price and J.P. Morgan, all these other firms think that you're in Fidelity's pocket. Oh. So you can't sign Fidelity first, but if you never sign Fidelity, then everyone says they don't have quorum. There's not enough data here. It's not comprehensive enough, right? So you have to get Fidelity like 15th or 18th or 23rd of your enterprise customers. You can't sign them first. Um, and that's something that somehow we, we managed to avoid some of the pitfalls we've seen affect other companies that have tried to build these consortium models where they either sign one big company too fast right. or they try to get everybody in the room to agree at the same time. You can't get everybody to agree in, a, in an industry like financial services. So you have to add value incrementally over time and then sl sort of pull people in at the right moment. Uh -huh. No, I think that model is, a, is very valuable in a lot of markets, and the, most markets are like that. You try and you show up out of the blue and you say, hey, I got this great idea. Everybody give me all your data and I'll do wonderful things with it. Sounds great. Yeah, it sounds great to you. Um, but so that, you know, it's, it's quite admirable to have that patience, that pacing, and, and get to that spot. So that's wonderful. Who else has got a question? Another table? This is the quietest this group has ever been. It's dinner time. It's dinner time? Drink time, sorry. So let me, let me just kind of do one more round here across here. Just, just basic lessons learned in starting the business, doing the pivot, you know, the kinds of things that you've, you've, you've uh, uh, done if you want to just share with the group some of the top thoughts you've got on, on how you've made your business go. Um, I think for me, it's really about perseverance. Yeah, and I've read a lot, a lot of times a company starts and you don't end up doing what you initially planned to do. And, and that does speak to perseverance and not giving up and trying to figure, you, know, you just really want to be successful. And whatever it is, you're going to find out what the, you know, the you've identified the value you've created within your company and try to exploit that. And be willing to make mistakes and admit you're wrong and then, and make changes and, and um, I think the, the strategy should really reflect where your company is today and what you can do going forward to maximize that. And you don't want to throw good money after bad. Mm -hmm. Chris, any thoughts? Yeah, no, that's a good one. I, I think perseverance is dead on um, and, and passion around making your company successful uh, despite, you know, if your first idea wasn't the best one, you got to be able to let go of it and, and, and kind of go after the big opportunity. But I think with that, if you can maintain kind of core values in the business for how you interview employees to how you build your products, I think that becomes really important as well. Mm -hmm. Mike, any parting thoughts? I'm always concerned about saying anything on a topic like this because you're always going to sound so somewhat trite. But um, for us, it's never stop 
changing the product because if you get too comfortable with the revenue that's coming from a product that starts to get sort of stable, you're at risk of sort of topping out. Mm -hmm. I've seen a lot of software companies hit five or 10 or even 25 million and then they just stop growing. Uh -huh. Um, and so we're really, really focused on not letting that happen to us. We uh, don't want to get stuck at 10 or 15 or whatever and then, and then never grow because our ambitions are bigger than that. So, so every time we think we're getting comfortable, we change it and we roll out something different that's a little bit bigger, hopefully. Uh -huh. so. Well, wonderful. Well, thank you, gentlemen. Excellent, all three of you, and I appreciate your thoughts and insights. And so is the group here. So, thank you very much. Thank you. Well, great, thank you. And I'd like to thank all of our panelists, Russell and all of you for a wonderful first day of, uh, well, second day technically of, of data content. So thank you very much.